This video is on two most important speeches on the climate emergency science. I'm Peter Carter for the Climate Emergency Institute. I'm making the video January 2020. It's in the way of a short-term retrospective on the 2019 Madrid United Nations COP25. That is the United Nations 25th Conference of the Parties to the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, if you've been following climate change at all, you will know that uh, the Madrid UN COP25, despite the best efforts of the hosts in Spain and the original hosts in Chile, there was total agreement that this conference was a failure. And this despite two climate emergency science speeches given at the opening of the conference. One by the chair of the IPCC, Ho Sung Lee, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the other one, which I'm showing in this video, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. So according to uh, Google, Google's news, these went by largely unpublicized. There was no news reports that I could find that included either of these two speeches. The opening ceremony is on YouTube, and you can go there and you'll see the whole of the opening ceremony and uh, these two most important speeches. So even if you are, and I hope that you are, an ardent follower of global climate change, it's very unlikely that you will have seen, read, or heard either of these two speeches. And uh, you will also see how important these speeches were and still are. First off on the conference's uh, tragic failure, Here's a statement by the Executive Secretary of the UN Climate Change Secretariat, Patricia Espinosa, with her sad report of the failure of the conference and the high emitting countries refusing to increase their paltry national emissions targets. This is the United Nations Secretary General's statement on uh, COP25. Uh, the COP25 was billed as time for action. The United Nations Secretary General expressing his deep disappointment, and I'm sure it would have been very hard for him because uh, nobody could have done more to explain and communicate the dire climate emergency which he's done for the past uh, 18 months. It is a great pleasure to address you on behalf of the IPCC at this opening of COP25. Let me start by reminding you that our IPCC assessments show that climate stabilization implies greenhouse gas emissions must start to peak from next year. And, but emissions are continuing to increase with no sign of peaking soon. As Secretary General mentioned, we are clearly in a crisis. Our three special reports on the warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, climate change and land, and the oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate, indicated that the impacts of current warming are much more severe than previously understood for example, accelerating sea level rise, ocean warming, some key ecosystems becoming much more vulnerable, and increasing risk of reaching adaptation, limits to adaptation. Climate impacts now and in the future increasingly challenge the adaptive capacity of society and ecosystems. Three special reports reconfirm the urgent need for immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Such immediate reductions would provide the world with much more space for cost-effective, 
and sustainable mitigation and adaptation options. Immediate reductions would generate opportunities for investment in innovation and technologies, for higher productivity in energy and resource use, in alternative technologies, for a world free of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, and for investment in know-how for achieving equitable transitions. These investments would generate powerful benefits spilling over to all sectors of the society and the economy, making them cleaner, healthier, and more resilient. And they would help achieve societal goals of poverty eradication and sustainable development. The failure to achieve such immediate emissions reductions will give the world the opposite of all this, in addition to the cascading impacts of a worsening climate. The world will suffer from stranded assets, the legacy of business as usual investment. The financial sector, above all, will face greater uncertainty due to risks from climate change and climate change policy. Food security will be threatened as a result of worsening climate and increased competition for land, arising from the need to use land as a vehicle for mitigations. The world will face increased risk of losses by biodiversity and ecosystem services. And as a result, the sustainable development goals such as zero poverty, zero hunger, and life on Earth will be compromised. There will be little room for ecosystem-based adaptation, blue carbon ecosystems, sustainable fisheries, and sustainable land management, as these adaptation options are effective only under low emission pathways. As Executive Secretary Espinoza has said, if we stay on our current path, we risk a sharp rise in global temperature increase this century, and I quote, this will have enormous negative consequences for humanity and threaten our existence on this planet. We need an immediate and urgent change in trajectory, achieving it is absolutely necessary to the health, safety, security of everyone of this planet, on this planet, both in the short and long term, unquote. The IPCC findings support your conclusions. We appreciate the challenge you face as a catalyst for the unprecedented change the society will need in the very short term as well as for the long term. Solidarity and flexibility are what we need in the race to beat the climate emergency. We stand at a critical juncture in our collective efforts to limit dangerous global heating. By the end of the coming decade, we will be on one of two paths. One is the path of surrender, where we have sleepwalked past the point of no return jeopardizing the health and safety of everyone on this planet. Do we really want to be remembered as the generation that buried its head in the sand, that fiddled while the planet burned? The other option is the path of hope, a path of resolve, of sustainable solutions, a path where more fossil fuels remain where they should be, in the ground, and where we are on the way to carbon neutrality by 2050. That is the only way to limit global temperature rise to the necessary 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. The best available science through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tell us today that going beyond that would lead us to catastrophic disaster. Millions throughout the world, especially young people, are calling on leaders from all sectors to do more, much more, to address the climate emergency we face. They know we need to get on the right path today, not tomorrow. And that means important decisions must be made now, and COP25 is our opportunity. Dear delegates, before I focus on what I believe we need to do at this session, let me step back to give a sense of perspective to our deliberations. 
the latest just related data from the World Meteorological Organization show that levels of heat trapping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have reached another record high. Global average levels of carbon dioxide reached 407.8 parts per million in 2018. And I remember not long ago, 400 parts per million was seen as an unthinkable tipping point. We are, way, we are well over it. The last time there was a comparable concentration of CO2 was between 3 and 5 million years ago, when the temperature was between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius warmer than now, and sea levels were 10 to 20 meters higher than today. The signs are unmissable. The last five years have been the hottest ever recorded. The consequences are already making themselves felt in the form of more extreme weather events and associated disasters, from hurricanes to drought to floods to wildfires. Ice caps are melting. In Greenland alone, 179 billion tons of ice melted in July. Permafrost in the Arctic is towing 60, 6, 70 years ahead of projections. And Antarctica is melting three times as fast as a decade ago. Ocean levels are rising quicker than expected, putting some of our biggest and most economically important cities at risk. More than two-thirds of the world's megacities are located by the sea. And while the oceans are rising, they are also being poisoned. Oceans absorb more than a quarter of our CO2 in the atmosphere and generate more than half of our oxygen. Absorbing more and more carbon dioxide acidifies the oceans and threatens all life within them. Three major reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on land, on the oceans and cryosphere, and on the 1.5 degrees Celsius climate goal each confirm that we are knowingly destroying the very support systems keeping us alive. And indeed, we are. In several regions of the world, coal power plants continue to be planned and built in large numbers. Either we stop this addiction to coal, or all our efforts to tackle climate change will be doomed. And as the UN Environment Programme has just revealed, Countries are planning to produce fossil fuels over the next decade at over double the level that is consistent with keeping, them keeping temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the fossil fuel industry is not alone. From agriculture to transportation, from urban planning and construction to cement, steel and other carbon intensive industries, we are far from a sustainable path. We see some incremental steps towards sustainable business models, but nowhere near the scope and scale required. What we need is not an incremental approach, but a transformational one. We need a rapid and deep change in the way we do business, how we generate power, how we build cities, how we move, and how we feed the world. If we don't urgently change our way of life, we jeopardize life itself. For the past year, I've been saying we need to make progress on carbon pricing, shift taxation from income to carbon, ensure no new coal plants are built after 2020, and then the allocation of taxpayers' money for perverse fossil fuel subsidies. We must also ensure that the transition to a green economy is a just transition one that recognizes the need to care for the future of negatively impacted workers in terms of new jobs, lifelong education, and social safety nets. If we want change, we must be that change. Choosing the passive hope is not the job of one person, one industry, or one government alone. We are all in this together. And the roadmap established by the scientific community is clear. To limit global temperature rise to the necessary 1.5 degrees by the end of this century, we must reduce emissions by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, and we must achieve climate neutrality 
by 2050. Ten years ago, if countries had acted on the science available, they would have needed to reduce emissions by 3.3% each year. We didn't. And today we need to reduce emissions by 7.6% each year to reach our goals. So it is imperative that governments not only honor their national contributions under the Paris Agreement, they need to substantially increase their ambitions. And even if the Paris commitments are fully met, it would not be enough. But unfortunately, many countries are not even doing that, and results are there to be seen. According to the latest emissions gap report from the UN Environmental Programme, greenhouse gas emissions have risen 1.5% a year over the last decade. At current trends, we are looking at global heating of between 3.5 and 3.9 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The impact on no life on the planet, including ours, would be catastrophic. The only solution is rapid, ambitious, transformative action by all – governments, regions, cities, businesses and civil society – all working together towards a common goal. And that was the purpose of the Climate Action Summit I convened in September. And in many ways it was encouraging. Small island nations and least developed countries, major cities and regional economies all came with initiatives as did a sizable representation from the private and financial sectors. Some 70 countries announced their intention to submit enhanced national contributions in 2020, with 65 countries and major subnational economies committing to work for net zero emissions by 2050. And I'm pleased to see governments and investors backing away from fossil fuels. A recent example is the European Investment Bank, which has announced it will stop funding fossil fuel projects by the end of 2021. But we are still waiting for transformative movement from most G20 countries, which represent more than three quarters of global emissions. My new report on the summit sets out what needs to be done going forward. Primarily, all the main emitters must do more. This means enhancing their national determined contributions in 2020 under the Paris Agreement, presenting a carbon neutrality strategy for 2050, and embarking on the decarbonization of key sectors, particularly energy, industry, construction and transport. Without the full engagement of the big emitters, all our efforts will be undermined. A green economy is not one to be feared, but an opportunity to be embraced, and one that can advance our efforts to achieve all the Sustainable Development Goals. But what frustrates me, and I believe what frustrates us all, is the slow pace of change, especially given that most of the tools and technologies we need are already available. So my call to you all today is to increase your ambition and your urgency. Dear delegates, we are here at COP25 to reach progress on key items, namely achieving success on Article 6 and continuing to boost ambition in preparation for new and revised national climate action plans due next year. Article 6 was the outstanding issue not resolved at COP24 in Katowice. To put a price on carbon is vital if you are to have any chance of limiting global temperature rise and avoiding runaway climate change. And operationalizing Article 6 will help get markets up and running, mobilize the private sector, and ensure that the rules are the same for everyone. Failure to operationalize Article 6 risks fragmenting the carbon markets and sends a negative message that can undermine our overall climate efforts. I urge all parties to overcome their current divisions and to find common understanding on this issue. And the COP will also advance work related to capacity building, deforestation, indigenous people, cities, finance, technology, gender and more. The COP must complete several technical matters to achieve the full operationalization 
of the transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. The tasks are many, the timelines are tight, every item is important. And it is imperative to complete our work and we have no time to spare. But as important as the successful conclusion of negotiations, the COP25 must convey to the world a firm determination to change course. We must finally demonstrate that we are serious in our commitment to stop the war against nature, that we have the political will to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. I expect all governments will be able to commit now to review during this next year on the way to COP26 in Glasgow their national determined contributions with the necessary ambition to defeat the climate, to defeat the climate emergency. Ambition in mitigation, ambition in adaptation, and ambition in finance. Let us not forget, we should ensure that at least 100 billion US dollars a year are available to development countries for mitigation and adaptation, and take into account their legitimate expectations to have the resources necessary to build resilience and for disaster response and recovery. Dear delegates, the decisions we make here will ultimately define whether we choose a path of hope or a path of surrender. And remember, we made a commitment to the people of the world through the Paris Agreement, and it was a solemn promise. Let us open our ears to the multitudes who are demanding change. Let us open our eyes to the imminent threat facing us all. Let us open our minds to the unanimity of the science there is no time and no reason to delay. We have the tools, we have the science, we have the resources. Let us show we also have the political will that people demand from us. To do anything less will be a betrayal of our entire human family and all the generations to come. Thank you.